Book 7, Chapter 11 of History of the Reformation in the Sixteenth Century, Volume 2, by Jean-Henri Mel d'Aubigné, translated by Henry Beveridge. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 11 Luther, having thus escaped from these walls of Worms, which threatened to become his tomb, his whole heart gave glory to God the devil himself said he guarded the citadel of the pope but christ has made a large breach in it and satan has been forced to confess that the lord is mightier than he the day of the dias of worms says the pious Mathesius, the disciple and friend of luther is one of the greatest and most glorious days given to the world before its final close the battle fought at worms re-echoed far and wide and while the sound travelled over christendom from the regions of the north to the mountains of switzerland and the cities of england france and italy many ardently took up the mighty weapon of the word of god luther having arrived at frankfurt on the evening of saturday twenty seventh of april took advantage next day of a moment of leisure the first he had had for a long time to write a note in a style at once playful and energetic to his friend lucas cranach the celebrated painter at wittemberg your servant dear compeer lucas said he to him i thought his majesty would assemble at worms some fifty doctors to confute the monk off-hand but not at all are these books yours yes will you retract them no ah well get you gone such was the whole story o oh, blind germans how like children we act in allowing ourselves to be played upon and duped by rome the jews must for once have their chant yo 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 but our passover also will come and then we will sing alleluia there must be silence and suffering for a short time jesus christ says a little while and ye shall not see me and again a little while and ye shall see me john chapter sixteen verse sixteen i hope it will be so with me i commend you altogether to the eternal may he through christ protect us against the attacks of the wolves and dragons of rome amen after writing this somewhat enigmatical letter luther as the time was pressing set out immediately for friedberg which is six leagues from frankfurt the next day luther again communed with himself he was desirous to write once more to charles v being unwilling to confound him with guilty rebels in his letter to the emperor he clearly expounded the nature of the obedience which is due to man and that which is due to god and the limit where the former must stop and give place to the latter in reading luther we involuntarily call to mind the saying of the greatest autocrat of modern times my rule ends where that of conscience begins napoleon to the protestant deputation after his accession to the empire god who is the searcher of hearts is my witness says luther that i am ready with all diligence to obey your majesty whether in honour or disgrace whether by life or by death and with absolutely no exception but the word of god from which man derives life in all the affairs of the present life my fidelity will be immutable for as to these loss or gain cannot at all affect salvation but in regard to eternal blessings it is not the will of god that man should submit to man subjection in the spiritual world constitutes worship and should be paid only to the creator luther also addressed a letter but in german to the states of the empire it was nearly the same in substance as that to the emperor it contained an account of all that had taken place at worms this letter was repeatedly printed and circulated all over germany everywhere says cochleus it excited the popular indignation against the emperor and the dignified clergy early next day luther wrote a note to spalatin enclosing in it the two letters which he had written the evening before and sent pack the herald sturm who had been won to the gospel 
Having embraced him, he set out in all haste for Grunberg. On Tuesday, when about two leagues from Hirschfeld, he met the Chancellor of the Abbot Prince of this town, who had come out to receive him. Shortly after, a troop of horsemen appeared with the Abbot at their head. The latter leapt from his horse, and Luther, having alighted from his carriage, the Prince and the Reformer embraced, and then entered Hirschfeld. The Senate received them at the gates. The princes of the church ran to meet a monk anathematized by the Pope and the most distinguished among the laity, bowed the head before an individual whom the emperor had put under the ban. At five in the morning we will be at the church, said the prince, on rising in the evening from table, at which the reformer was a guest. He even wished Luther to occupy his own bed. Next day Luther preached, the abbot prince accompanying him with his suite. In the evening Luther arrived at Eisenach, the abode of his infancy. All his friends in the town gathered round him and begged him to preach. The next day they conducted him to the church. The curate made his appearance, attended by a notary and witnesses. He came forward in great tremor, divided between the fear of losing his place and that of opposing the powerful man before him. At last he said, in a tone of embarrassment, I protest against the liberty which you are going to take. Luther mounted the pulpit, and that voice which, twenty-three years before, sung in the streets of this town for bread, caused the arches of the ancient church to ring with accents which had begun to shake the world. After the sermon, the curate, in confusion, stepped softly forward to Luther. The notary had drawn up his instrument, the witnesses had signed it, and everything was in regular order to put the curate's place in safety. "'Pardon me,' said he humbly to the doctor, "'I have done it from fear of the tyrants who oppress the church.' There was, in fact, some ground to fear them. At Worms, the aspect of affairs had changed. Aleander seemed to reign supreme. Luther has nothing before him but exile, wrote Frederick to his brother, Duke John. Nothing can save him. If God permits me to return, I will have things almost incredible to tell you. Not only Annas and Caiaphas, but also Pilate and Herod have leagued against him. Frederick, having little wish to remain longer, left Worms. The elector Palatine did the same, as did also the archbishop-elector of Cologne. Princes of less elevated rank imitated them. Deeming it impossible to avert the blow which was about to be struck, they preferred, perhaps erroneously, to abandon the place. The Spaniards, Italians, and the most ultramontane of the German princes alone remained. The field was free, and Aleander triumphed. He laid before Charles the draft of an edict which he intended should serve as the model of that which the Diet was to issue against the monk. The nuncio's labour pleased the irritated emperor. He assembled the remains of the Diet in his chamber, and caused Aleander's edict to be read to them. All who were present, so says Pallavicini, approved it. The next day, the day of a great festival, the emperor was in the church, surrounded by the nobility of his court. The religious solemnity was finished, and a multitude of people filled the church. Then Aleander, clad in all the insignia of his rank, approached Charles V. He held in his hand two copies of the edict against Luther, the one in Latin and the other in German, and, kneeling down before his majesty, implored him to append his signature and the seal of the empire. It was at the moment when the host had just been offered, when incense filled the temple, when music was still ringing under its arches, and, as it were, in the presence of the divinity, that the destruction of the enemy of Rome was to be completed. The emperor, assuming the most gracious manner, took the pen and signed. Aleander went off in triumph, put the decree immediately to press, and sent it all over Christendom. This fruit of the labour of Rome had cost the papacy some pains. Pallavicini himself informs us that this edict, though dated the 8th of May, was signed later, but was antedated 
to make it be supposed that it was executed during the time when all the members of the diet were actually assembled we charles v said the emperor then followed all his titles to all the electors princes prelates and others whom it may concern the almighty having entrusted to us for the defence of his holy faith more kingdoms and power than he gave to any of our predecessors we mean to exert ourselves to the utmost to prevent any heresy from arising to pollute our holy empire the augustine monk martin luther though exhorted by us has rushed like a madman against the holy church and sought to destroy it by means of books filled with blasphemy he has in a shameful manner insulted the imperishable law of holy wedlock he has striven to excite the laity to wash their hands in the blood of priests and overturning all obedience has never ceased to stir up revolt division war murder theft and fire and to labour completely to ruin the faith of christians in a word to pass over all his other iniquities in silence this creature who is not a man but satan himself under the form of a man covered with the cowl of a monk has collected into one stinking pool all the worst heresies of past times and has added several new ones of his own we have therefore sent this luther from before our face that all pious and sensible men may regard him as a fool or a man possessed of the devil and we expect that after the expiry of his safe conduct effectual means will be taken to arrest his furious rage wherefore under pain of incurring the punishment due to the crime of treason we forbid you to lodge the said luther so soon as the fatal term shall be expired to conceal him give him meat or drink and lend him by word or deed publicly or secretly any kind of assistance we enjoin you moreover to seize him or cause him to be seized wherever you find him and bring him to us without any delay or to keep him in all safety until you hear from us how you are to act with regard to him and till you receive the recompense due to your exertions in so holy a work as to his adherents you will seize them suppress them and confiscate their goods as to his writings if the best food becomes the terror of all mankind as soon as a drop of poison is mixed with it how much more ought these books which contain a deadly poison to the soul to be not only rejected but also annihilated you will therefore burn them or in some other way destroy them entirely as to authors poets printers painters sellers or buyers of placards writings or paintings against the pope or the church you will lay hold of their persons and their goods and treat them according to your good pleasure and if any one whatever be his dignity shall dare to act in contradiction to the decree of our imperial majesty we ordain that he shall be placed under the ban of the empire let every one conform hereto such was the edict signed in the cathedral of worms it was more than a roman bull which though published in italy might not be executed in germany the emperor himself had spoken and the diet had ratified his decree all the partisans of rome sent forth a shout of triumph it is the end of the tragedy exclaimed they for my part said alfonso valdez a spaniard at the emperor's court i am persuaded that it is not the end but the beginning valdez perceived that the movement was in the church in the people in the age and that though luther should fall his cause would not fall with him but no one disguised to himself the imminent the inevitable danger to which the reformer was exposed while the whole tribe of the superstitious was seized with horror at the thought of the incarnate satan whom the emperor pointed out to the nation as disguised under a monk's frock the man against whom the mighty of the earth were thus forging their thunders had left the church of eisenach and was preparing to separate from some of his dearest friends he did not wish to follow the road of gotha or erfurt but to repair to the village of mora his father's birthplace that he might there see his grandmother who died four months after his uncle henry luther and other relations 
Schürf, Jonas, and Swaven set off for Wittenberg. Luther mounted his vehicle with Amsdorf, who remained with him, and entered the forest of Thuringia. The same evening he reached the village of his fathers. The poor old peasant clasped in her arms this grandson who had just been showing front to the Emperor Charles and Pope Leo. Luther spent the next day with his family, happy in substituting this tranquil scene for the tumult at Worms. On the following day he resumed his journey, accompanied by Amsdorf and his brother James. In these lonely spots the reformer's lot was to be decided. They were passing along the forest of Thuringia, on the road to Wallershausen. As the carriage was in a hollow part of the road near the old church of Glisbach, at some distance from the castle of Altenstein, a sudden noise was heard, and at that moment five horsemen, masked and in complete armour, rushed upon the travellers. Luther's brother, as soon as he perceived the assailants, leapt from the vehicle and ran off at full speed without uttering a word. The driver was for defending himself. Stop! cried one of the assailants in a stern voice, and rushed upon him and threw him to the ground. A second man in a mask seized Amsdorf and prevented him from coming near. Meanwhile the three other horsemen laid hold of Luther, keeping the most profound silence. They pulled him violently from the carriage, threw a horseman's cloak upon his shoulders, and placed him on a led horse. Then the other two quitted Amsdorf and the driver, and the whole leapt into their saddles. The hat of one of them fell off, but they did not even stop to lift it, and in a twinkling disappeared in the dark forest with their prisoner. They at first took the road to Broderode, but they soon retraced their steps by a different road, and, without quitting the forest, made turnings and windings in all directions, in order to deceive those who might attempt to follow their track. Luther, little accustomed to horseback, was soon overcome with fatigue. Being permitted to dismount for a few moments, he rested near a beech tree and took a draught of fresh water from a spring, which is still called Luther's Spring. His brother James, always continuing his flight, arrived in the evening at Wallershausen. The driver, in great alarm, had got up on his vehicle into which Amsdorf also mounted, and, urging on his horses, which proceeded at a rapid pace, brought Luther's friend as far as Wittenberg. At Wallershausen and Wittenberg and the interjacent country villages and towns, all along the road, news of Luther's having been carried off were spread, news which, while it delighted some, filled the greater number with astonishment and indignation. A cry of grief soon resounded throughout Germany, luther has fallen into the hands of his enemies after the violent combat which luther had been obliged to maintain god was pleased to conduct him to a peaceful resting-place after placing him on the brilliant theatre of worms where all the powers of the reformer's soul had been so vigorously exerted he gave him the obscure and humiliating retreat of a prison from the deepest obscurity he brings forth the feeble instruments by which he proposes to accomplish great things, and then, after allowing them to shine for a short time with great lustre on an elevated stage, sends them back again to deep obscurity. Violent struggles and pompous displays were not the means by which the Reformation was to be accomplished. That is not the way in which the leaven penetrates the mass of the population. The Spirit of God requires more tranquil paths. The man of whom the champions of Rome were always in pitiless pursuit behoved for a time to disappear from the world. It was necessary that personal achievements should be eclipsed in order that the revolution about to be accomplished might not bear the impress of an individual. It was necessary that man should retire and God alone remain, moving by his spirit over the abyss in which the darkness of the middle age was engulfed and saying let there be light nightfall having made it impossible to follow their track the party carrying off luther took a new direction and about an hour before midnight arrived at the foot of a mountain 
the horses climbed slowly to its summit on which stood an old fortress surrounded on all sides except that of the entrance by the black forests which cover the mountains of thuringia to this elevated and isolated castle named the wartburg where the landgraves of old used to conceal themselves was luther conducted the bolts are drawn the iron bars fall the gates open and the reformer clearing the threshold the bars again close behind him he dismounts in the court burkhard de hunt lord of allenstein one of the horsemen withdraws another john of berlepsch provost of wartburg conducts luther to the chamber which was to be his prison and where a knight's dress and a sword were lying the three other horsemen dependents of the provost carry off his ecclesiastical dress and put on the other which had been prepared for him enjoining him to allow his hair and beard to grow in order that none even in the castle might know who he was the inmates of the wartburg were only to know the prisoner under the name of chevalier georges luther scarcely knew himself in the dress which was put upon him at length he is left alone and can turn in his thoughts the strange events which had just taken place at worms the uncertain prospect which awaits him and his new and strange abode from the narrow windows of his keep he discovers the dark solitary and boundless forests around there says Mathesius, the biographer and friend of luther the doctor remained like st paul in his prison at rome frederick de thun philip feilich and spalatin had not concealed from luther in a confidential interview which they had with him at worms by the order of the elector that his liberty behoved to be sacrificed to the wrath of charles and the pope still there was so much mystery in the mode of his being carried off that frederick was long ignorant of the place of his confinement the grief of the friends of the reformation was prolonged spring passed away succeeded by summer autumn and winter the sun finished his annual course and the walls of the wartburg still confined their prisoner the truth is laid under interdict by the diet its defender shut up within the walls of a strong castle has disappeared from the stage of the world none knowing what has become of him aleander triumphs and the reformation seems lost but god reigns and the blow which apparently threatened to annihilate the cause of the gospel will serve only to save its intrepid minister and extend the light of faith let us leave luther a captive in germany on the heights of the wartburg and let us see what god was then doing in the other countries of christendom end of chapter eleven end of book seven Book Eight, Chapter One of History of the Reformation in the Sixteenth Century, Volume Two, by Jean Henri Mel d'Aubigne, translated by Henry Beveridge. This recording is in the public domain. Recording by Christopher Smith. Book Eight, The Swiss, fourteen hundred and eighty-four to fifteen hundred and twenty-two. Chapter One at the moment when the decree of the diet of worms appeared a continually increasing movement was beginning to shake the quiet valleys of switzerland the voice which was heard in the plains of upper and lower saxony was answered from the bosom of the helvetic mountains by the energetic voices of its priests its shepherds and the citizens of its warlike cities the partisans of rome seized with terror exclaimed that a vast and dreadful conspiracy was everywhere formed against the church the friends of the gospel filled with joy said that as in spring a living breath is felt from the streams which run into the sea up to the mountain tops so throughout all christendom the spirit of god was now melting the ices of a long winter and covering with verdure and flowers the lowest plains as well as the steepest and most barren rocks germany did not communicate the truth to switzerland nor switzerland to france nor france to england 
all these countries received it from god just as one part of the world does not transmit the light to another part but the same shining globe communicates it directly to all the earth christ the dayspring from on high infinitely exalted above all mankind was at the period of the reformation as at that of the establishment of christianity the divine fire which gave life to the world in the sixteenth century one and the same doctrine was at once established in the homes and churches of the most distant and diversified nations the reason is that the same spirit was everywhere at work producing the same faith the reformation of germany and that of switzerland demonstrate this truth zwinglius had no intercourse with luther there was no doubt a link between these two men but we must search for it above the earth he who from heaven gave the truth to luther gave it to zwinglius god was the medium of communication between them i began to preach the gospel says zwinglius in the year of grace fifteen hundred and sixteen in other words at a time when the name of luther had never been heard in our country i did not learn the doctrine of christ from luther but from the word of god if luther preaches christ he does what i do that is all but if the different reformations which all proceeded from the same spirit thereby acquired great unity they also received certain peculiar features corresponding to the different characters of the people among whom they took place we have already given a sketch of the state of switzerland at the period of the reformation and will add only a few words to what we have already said in germany the ruling principle was monarchical in switzerland it was democratic in germany the reformation had to struggle with the will of princes in switzerland with the will of the people a multitude are more easily led away than an individual and are also more prompt in their decisions the victory over the papacy on the other side of the rhine was the work of years but on this side of it required only months or days in germany luther's person stands forth imposingly from the midst of his saxon countrymen he seems to struggle alone in his attack on the roman colossus and wherever the battle is fought we see his lofty stature on the field of battle luther is as it were the monarch of the revolution which is being accomplished in switzerland several cantons are at once engaged in the contest we see a confederacy of reformers and are astonished at their numbers no doubt there is one head which stands elevated above the rest but no one has the command it is a republican magistracy where each presents his peculiar physiognomy and exercises his separate influence we have wittemberg zwinglius capito haller echolampadius again we have oswald myconius leo judah farrell calvin and the reformation takes place at claris Baal, zurich berne neuchatel geneva lucerne schaffhausen appenzell st gall and in the grisons in the reformation of germany one scene only is seen and that one level like the country around but in switzerland the reformation is divided as switzerland itself is divided by its thousand mountains so to speak each valley has its awakening and each alpine height its gleams of light a lamentable period had commenced in the history of the swiss after their exploits against the dukes of burgundy europe which had learned to know the strength of their arm had brought them forth from their mountains and robbed them of their independence by employing them to decide the destiny of states on battlefields swiss brandished the sword against swiss on the plains of italy and france and the intrigues of strangers filled these high valleys of the alps so long the abode of simplicity and peace with envy and discord led away by the attraction of gold sons labourers and servants stole away from the chalets of alpine pastures towards the banks of the rhine or the po 
helvetic unity was crushed under the slow step of mules loaded with gold the object of the reformation in switzerland for there too it had a political aspect was to re-establish the unity and ancient virtues of the cantons its first cry was that the swiss should tear asunder the perfidious nets of strangers and embrace each other in strict union at the foot of the cross but the generous call was not listened to rome accustomed to purchase in these valleys the blood which she shed in order to increase her power rose up in wrath she set swiss against swiss and new passions arose which rent the body of the nation in pieces switzerland stood in need of a reformation it is true there was among the helvetians a simplicity and good nature which the polished italians thought ridiculous but at the same time it was admitted that by no people were the laws of chastity more habitually transgressed astrologers ascribed this to the constellations philosophers to the ardent temperament of this indomitable population and moralists to the principles of the swiss who regarded trick dishonesty and slander as much greater sins than uncleanness the priests were prohibited from marrying but it would have been difficult to find one of them who lived in true celibacy the thing required of them was to conduct themselves not chastely but prudently this was one of the first disorders against which the reformation was directed it is time to trace the beginnings of this new day in the valleys of the alps towards the middle of the eleventh century two hermits set out from st gall and proceeding towards the mountains at the south of this ancient monastery arrived in a deserted valley about ten leagues long towards the north the high mountains of santis the Solmerikov, and the old man separate this valley from the canton of appenzel on the south the kurfürsten with its seven heads rises between it and the valenses sargans and the grison while the eastern side of the valley opens to the rays of the rising sun and discovers the magnificent prospect of the tyrolese alps the two solitaries having arrived near the source of a small river the tour built two cells the valley gradually became inhabited on the highest portion of it two thousand and ten feet above the lake of zurich there was formed around a church a village named wildhaus or the wild house with which two hamlets are now connected that is lisikhaus or the house of elizabeth and schoenenboden the fruits of the earth are unable to grow upon these heights a green carpet of alpine freshness covers the whole valley and rises upon the sides of the mountains above which masses of enormous rocks lift their wild grandeur towards heaven at a quarter of a league from the church near lisikhaus on the side of a path which leads into the pastures beyond the river a solitary house is still standing the tradition is that the wood used in building it was cut upon the very spot everything indicates that it must have been erected at a very remote period the walls are thin the windows have little round panes and the roof is formed of slabs on which stones are laid to prevent the wind from carrying them away in front of the house there is a limpid gushing spring in this house towards the end of the fifteenth century lived a man named zwinglius amman or bailiff of the district the family of the zwingles or zwingli was ancient and in high esteem among the inhabitants of these mountains bartholomew brother of the bailiff at first curate of the parish and after fourteen eighty seven dean of Vesen, was a person of some celebrity in the district margaret miley the wife of the amman of wildhaus and whose brother john was afterwards abbot of the convent of fishingen in turgovia had already given birth to two sons heine and klaus when on the first day of the year fourteen hundred and eighty four seven weeks after the birth of luther a third son ulrich was born in this solitary hut five other sons john wolfgang bartholomew james andrew and a daughter anna 
were afterwards added to this alpine family no person in the country was more venerated than Aman Zwinglius. His character, his office, his numerous children made him the patriarch of these mountains. He and all his sons were shepherds. No sooner did the first days of May open upon these mountains than the father and the children departed with their flocks for the pastures, rising gradually from station to station, and so, towards the end of July, reaching the highest summits of the Alps. Then they began gradually to redescend towards the valley, and in autumn the whole population of Wildhaus returned to their humble huts. Sometimes, during the summer, the young people who had been obliged to remain at home, eager for the mountain breezes, set out in bands for the chalets, uniting their voices to the melody of their rustic instruments. On their arrival on the Alps, the shepherds from a distance saluted them with their horns and their songs, and regaled them with a feast of milk. Afterwards the joyous band, by turnings and windings, descended again into the valley, moving to the sound of their pipes. Ulrich, in his youth, doubtless joined occasionally in this amusement. He grew up at the foot of those rocks which seem eternal, and whose tops reach the heavens i have often thought says one of his friends that being brought near to heaven on these sublime heights he there contracted something celestial and divine there were long winter evenings in the cottages of wildhaus and then young ulrich seated at the paternal hearth listened to the conversation of the bailiff and the old men of the district he heard them tell how the inhabitants of the valley had formerly groaned under a heavy yoke with the old men his heart beat high at the thought of the independence which the Tockenburg had acquired, and which the alliance with the Swiss had secured. A patriotic feeling was kindled in his breast. Switzerland became dear to him, and if any one uttered an unfavourable expression against the Confederates, the child instantly stood up and warmly defended their cause. During these long evenings he was often seen quietly seated at the feet of his pious grandmother, with his eyes riveted upon her, listening to her Bible stories and devout lessons, as he eagerly received them into his heart. End of chapter 1book eight chapter two of history of the reformation in the sixteenth century volume two by jean henri mel d'aubigne translated by henry beveridge this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter two the good aman or bailiff was delighted with the happy presages in his son he perceived that Ulrich would be able to do something else than herd his cows on Mount Santis, singing the shepherd's song. One day he took him by the hand and proceeded with him towards Vesen. He traversed the verdant ridges of the Ammon, avoiding the wild and precipitous rocks which border the lake of Wallenstadt. On arriving at the town, he called upon his brother, the dean, to whom he entrusted the young mountaineer, in order that he might ascertain what his talents were the leading feature in his character was an innate horror at falsehood and a great love of truth he himself relates that one day when he was beginning to reflect the thought struck him that falsehood should be punished more severely than even theft for adds he veracity is the parent of all the virtues the dean soon loved his nephew as if he had been his son delighted with his sprightliness he entrusted his education to a schoolmaster who in a short time taught him all that he knew himself young ulrich when ten years of age having given indications of a high order of intellect his father and his uncle resolved on sending him to baal when the child of the Tockenburg arrived in this celebrated city, with an integrity and purity of heart which he seemed to have inhaled from the pure air of his mountains, but which came from a higher source, a new world opened before him. The celebrity of the famous Council of Baal, 
the university which pius the second had founded in fourteen hundred and sixty the printing presses which revived the masterpieces of antiquity and circulated over the world the first fruits of the revival of letters the residence of distinguished men the wesels the wittembachs and in particular that prince of scholars and luminary of the schools erasmus rendered baal at the period of the reformation one of the great foci of light in the west ulrich entered the school of st theodore which was taught by gregory binsley a man of an affectionate and gentle temper at this period rare among teachers young zwinglius made rapid progress the learned disputes which were then fashionable among the doctors of universities had even descended to the youth in schools ulrich took part in them he exercised his growing strength against the children of other schools and was always victorious in those struggles which formed a kind of prelude to those by which the papacy was to be overthrown in switzerland his success excited the jealousy of rivals older than himself the school of baal was soon outstripped by him as that of wesen had been lupulus a distinguished scholar had just opened at bern the first learned school that was founded in switzerland the bailiff of wildhaus and the curate of wesen resolved to send their child thither and zwinglius in fourteen ninety seven quitting the smiling plains of baal again drew near to the high alps where he had spent his childhood and whose snowy tops gilded with the rays of the sun he could see from bern lupulus a distinguished poet introduced his pupil to the sanctuary of classic literature a sanctuary then unknown only a few of the initiated having passed the threshold the young neophyte ardently breathed an atmosphere rich in the perfumes of antiquity his intellect was developed and his style formed he became a poet among the convents of bern that of the dominicans held a distinguished place these monks were engaged in a serious quarrel with the franciscans the latter maintained the immaculate conception of the virgin while the former denied it in every step the dominicans took before the rich altars which decorated their church and between the twelve pillars on which its arches were supported they thought only of humbling their rivals they had observed the fine voice of zwinglius and heard of his precocious intellect and thinking that he might throw lustre on their order strove to gain him with this view they invited him to remain in their convent till he should make his novitiate the whole prospects of vinglius were threatened the amman of wildhaus having been informed of the bait to which the dominicans had had recourse trembled for the innocence of his son and ordered him forthwith to quit bern zwinglius thus escaped those monastic enclosures into which luther rushed voluntarily what happened afterwards may enable us to comprehend the imminent danger to which zwinglius had been exposed in fifteen hundred and seven great excitement prevailed in the town of bern a young man of zurzach named john jetzer having one day presented himself at this same dominican convent had been repulsed the poor youth in despair had returned to the charge holding in his hand fifty-three florins and some pieces of silk it is all i possess said he take it and receive me into your order he was admitted on the sixth of january among the lay brothers but the very first night a strange noise in his cell filled him with terror he fled to the carthusian convent but was again sent back to that of the dominicans on the following night being the eve of the feast of st matthew he was awoken by deep sighs and perceived at his bedside a tall phantom in white i am said a sepulchral voice a soul escaped from the fire of purgatory the lay brother trembling replied god save you for me i can do nothing then the spirit advanced towards the poor friar and seizing him by the throat indignantly upbraided him with his refusal yet sir in terror exclaimed what then can i do to save you 
flagellate yourself for eight days till the blood comes and lie prostrate on the pavement of the chapel of st john so answered the spirit and disappeared the lay brother gave information of the apparition to his confessor a preacher of the convent and by his advice submitted to the discipline required the rumour soon spread throughout the town that a soul had applied to the dominicans to be delivered from purgatory the franciscans were deserted and every one ran to the church to see the holy man lying prostrate on the ground the soul from purgatory had intimated that he would reappear in eight days on the night appointed it did in fact appear accompanied by two other spirits that were tormenting it and howling horribly scotus said the spirit scotus the inventor of the franciscan doctrine of the immaculate conception of the virgin is among those who like me are suffering these fierce pains at this news which soon spread over bern the partisans of the franciscans were still more alarmed the spirit on disappearing had announced a visit from the virgin herself in fact on the day appointed the astonished friar saw mary herself appear in his cell he could not believe his eyes she approached him kindly gave him three of our saviour's tears three drops of his blood a crucifix and a letter addressed to pope julius the second who said she was the individual chosen by god to abolish the festival of her pretended immaculate conception then coming still closer to the bed on which the friar lay she announced in a solemn tone that a great grace was to be conferred on him and drove a nail into his hand the lay brother uttered a loud shriek but mary wrapped up his hand in a piece of linen which her son she said had worn after his flight into egypt this wound was not sufficient to make the glory of the dominicans equal to that of the franciscans yet sir must have the five wounds of christ and of st francis in his hands feet and side the four others were inflicted and then after giving him a draught he was placed in a hall hung with pictures representing our saviour's passion here having spent whole days fasting his imagination soon became heated the doors of the hall were then thrown open from time to time to the public who came in crowds to contemplate with devout astonishment the friar with his five wounds stretching out his arms bending his head and by his positions and gestures imitating the crucifixion of our lord sometimes out of his wits he foamed and seemed about to breathe his last the whisper went round he is enduring the cross of christ the multitude eager for miracles continually thronged the convent men worthy of high esteem among others lupulus himself the master of zwinglius were overawed and the dominicans from the height of the pulpit extolled the glory which god was bestowing on their order this order had for some years felt the necessity of humbling the franciscans and of augmenting the respect and liberality of the people by means of miracles bern a simple rustic and ignorant town as the sub-prior of bern described it to the chapter held at wimpfen on the necker had been selected as the theatre of their operations the prior sub-prior preacher and purveyor of the convent had undertaken to perform the leading characters but they wanted the talent necessary to perform them to the end a new apparition of mary having taken place yet sir thought he recognized the voice of his confessor and having said so aloud mary disappeared she soon made her appearance again to censure the incredulous friar this time it is the prior exclaimed yetzer rushing forward with a knife in his hand the saint s threw a pewter plate at the poor friar's head and likewise disappeared in consternation at the discovery which yetzer had thus made the dominicans tried to disencumber themselves of him by means of poison he perceived it and having taken flight disclosed the imposition they put on a good countenance and sent deputies to rome 
the pope committed the decision to his legate in switzerland and the bishops of lausanne and sion the four dominicans being convicted were condemned to be burnt alive and on first of may fifteen hundred and nine were consumed by the flames in the presence of more than thirty thousand spectators the affair made a noise throughout europe and by unveiling one of the worst sores of the church prepared the reformation such were the men into whose hands ulrich zwinglius had nearly fallen he had studied literature at bern he behoved now to devote himself to philosophy and with this view repaired to vienna a youth from st gall named joachim vadian whose genius gave promise to switzerland of a distinguished scholar and a statesman henry loretti of the canton of glaris commonly called glarian and apparently destined to shine among poets john heigelin son of a forge-master and hence surnamed faber of a versatile temper fond of honour and glory possessing all the qualities indicative of a courtier such were ulrich's fellow-students and companions in the capital of austria zwinglius returned to wildhaus in fifteen hundred and two but on revisiting his mountains he felt that he had drunk of the cup of science and could no longer live amid the songs of his brothers and the bleating of their flocks he was eighteen years of age and repaired to Bâle to engage again in literary pursuits and thus at once master and pupil he taught at the school of st martin and studied at the university from this time he was able to dispense with assistance from his father shortly after he took the degree of master of arts an alsatian named capito nine years older than he was one of his best friends zwinglius devoted himself to the study of scholastic theology for being called one day to combat its sophisms he behoved to explore its obscure labyrinth but the light-hearted student of the mountains of santis was often seen suddenly to shake off the dust of the school and substituting amusement for his philosophic toils seize the lute or the harp or the violin or the flute or the tympanon or the cornet or the hunting-horn extract joyous sounds from these instruments as in the prairies of lysig house and make his lodgings or the dwellings of his friends re-echo with the airs of his country accompanying them with his voice in regard to music he was a true child of the tockenberg superior to all in addition to the instruments we have already named he played several others an enthusiast in the art he diffused a taste for it in the university not from any desire of dissipation but because he loved thus to relax his mind when fatigued by serious study and fit himself for returning with greater zeal to difficult labours none had a gayer humour a more amiable disposition or more engaging conversation he was a vigorous alpine tree which developed itself in all its gracefulness and strength and which never having been pruned threw out strong branches in all directions the time was coming when these branches would turn vigorously in the direction of heaven after he had forced an entrance into scholastic theology he left its arid tracts fatigued and disgusted having found nothing in it but confused ideas vain babbling vain glory barbarism and not one sound idea of doctrine it is only a loss of time said he and waited for something better at this time november fifteen hundred and five arrived at Baal thomas wittembach son of a burgomaster of bm wittembach had till then taught at tubingen side by side with reuchlin he was in the vigour of life sincere pious skilled in the liberal arts and mathematics and well acquainted with the holy scriptures zwinglius and all the academic youth immediately flocked around him a spirit hitherto unknown animated his lectures and prophetic words escaped from his lips the time is not distant said he when scholastic theology will be abolished and the ancient doctrine of the church restored the death of christ added he is the only ransom of our souls 
the heart of zwinglius eagerly received these seeds of life at this period classical studies began everywhere to supplant the scholastics of the middle age zwinglius like his preceptors and friends threw himself into this new course among the students who followed the lessons of the new teacher with the greatest enthusiasm was a young man of twenty-three of small stature and a feeble sickly appearance but whose eye bespoke at once gentleness and intrepidity this was leo judah son of an alsatian curate and whose uncle had fallen at rhodes fighting in defence of christendom under the standard of the teutonic knights leo and ulrich were on intimate terms leo played the tympanon and had a very fine voice the joyous melodies of the young friends of the arts were often heard in his lodgings leo judah at a later period became the colleague of zwinglius and even death could not destroy their sacred friendship at this time the office of pastor of glaris having become vacant henry goldley a young courtier of the pope and groom of the stable to his holiness obtained the appointment from his master and hastened with it to glaris but the glarian shepherds proud of the antiquity of their race and of their battles for freedom were not disposed to bow implicitly to a piece of parchment from rome wildhaus is not far from glaris and wesen where zwinglius uncle was curate is the place where the market of the district is held the reputation of the young master of arts of baal had penetrated even into these mountains and the glarians wishing to have him for their priest gave him a call in fifteen hundred and six zwinglius having been ordained at constance by the bishop preached his first sermon at rappersville read his first mass at wildhaus on st michael's day in the presence of all his relations and the friends of the family and towards the close of the year arrived at glaris end of chapter two book eight chapter three of history of the reformation in the sixteenth century volume two by jean henri mail d'aubigne translated by henry beveridge this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter three zwinglius immediately engaged in the zealous discharge of the work which his vast parish imposed upon him still he was only twenty-two years of age and often allowed himself to be carried away by the dissipation and lax ideas of his age a priest of rome he was like the other priests around him but even at this period even though the evangelical doctrine had not changed his heart zwinglius did not give way to those scandals which frequently afflicted the church he always felt the need of subjecting his passions to the holy rule of the gospel a love of war at this time inflamed the quiet valleys of glaris where there were families of heroes the studis the valas the iblis whose blood had flowed on the field of battle the youth listened with eagerness to the old warriors when they told them of the wars of burgundy and swabia of the battles of st james and ragaz but alas it was no longer against the enemies of their liberties that these warlike shepherds took up arms they were seen at the bidding of the kings of france of the emperor the dukes of man or the holy father himself descending from the alps like an avalanche and rushing with the noise of thunder against the troops drawn up in the plain a poor boy named matthew schinner who was at the school of zion in the valley it was toward the middle of the latter half of the fifteenth century singing before the houses as young martin luther shortly after did heard himself called by an old man who being struck with the frankness with which the child answered his questions said to him with that prophetic spirit with which man is said to be sometimes endowed when on the brink of the grave thou art to be a bishop and a prince the expression sunk deep into the young mendicant and from that moment boundless ambition took possession of his heart at zurich and como the progress he made astonished his masters having become curate of a small parish in valais he rose rapidly 
and being sent at a later period to ask from the pope the confirmation of a bishop of sion who had just been elected he obtained the bishopric for himself and girt his brow with the episcopal mitre this man ambitious and crafty but often noble and generous always considered any dignity bestowed upon him as only a step destined to raise him to some still higher dignity having offered his services to louis the twelfth and named his price it is too much for one man said the king i will show him replied the bishop of zion offended that i am a man worth several men in fact he turned towards pope julius the second who gladly received him and schinner succeeded in fifteen hundred and ten in linking the whole swiss confederation to the policy of this ambitious pontiff the bishop having been rewarded with a cardinal's hat smiled when he saw that there was now only one step between him and the papal throne schinner's eye was continually turned to the cantons of switzerland and as soon as he there discerned any man of influence he hastened to attach him to himself the pastor of glaris drew his attention and zwinglius soon received intimation that the pope had granted him an annual pension of fifty florins to encourage him in the cultivation of letters his poverty did not allow him to purchase books and the money during the short time that ulrich received it was devoted to the purchase of classical or theological works which he procured from baal zwinglius was now connected with the cardinal and accordingly joined the roman party schinner and julius the second at last disclosed the end which they had in view in these intrigues eight thousand swiss mustered by the eloquence of the cardinal archbishop passed the alps but famine war and french gold obliged them to return to their mountains without glory they brought back the usual results of these foreign wars distrust licentiousness party spirit all sorts of violence and disorder citizens refused to obey their magistrates and children their parents agriculture and the care of their flocks were neglected luxury and mendicity kept pace with each other the most sacred ties were broken and the confederation seemed on the point of being dissolved the eyes of the young curate of glaris were now opened and his indignation aroused he raised his voice aloud to warn them of the abyss into which they were about to fall in fifteen hundred and ten he published his poem entitled the labyrinth behind the windings of this mysterious garden minos has hidden the minotaur that monster half man half bull whom he feeds on the flesh of young athenians the minotaur in other words says zwinglius sin vice irreligion and the foreign service of the swiss devour the sons of his countrymen theseus a man of courage wishes to deliver his country but numerous obstacles arrest him first a lion with one eye this is spain and aragon then a crowned eagle whose throat is opened to devour it this is the empire then a cock with his comb up and calling for battle this is france the hero surmounts all these obstacles gets up to the monster stabs it and saves his country so now exclaimed the poet men wander in a labyrinth but having no thread to guide them they cannot regain the light nowhere is there any imitation of jesus christ a little glory makes us hazard our life torment our neighbour rush into strife war and combat one would say that the furies have escaped from the depths of hell a theseus a reformer was required zwinglius perceived this and thenceforth had a presentiment of his mission not long after he composed an allegory with a still clearer application in april fifteen hundred and twelve the confederates rose anew at the bidding of the cardinal for the deliverance of the church glaris was in the foremost rank the whole population was brought into the field ranged round their banner with their landerman and their pastor zwinglius behoved to march 
the army passed the alps and the cardinal appeared amidst the confederates with the presents given him by the pope a ducal hat adorned with pearls and gold and surmounted by the holy spirit represented under the form of a dove the swiss escaladed the fortresses and towns swam rivers in the presence of the enemy unclothed and with halberds in their hands the french were everywhere put to flight bells and trumpets resounded and the population flocked from all quarters the nobles supplied the army with wine and fruits in abundance the monks and priests mounted on platforms and proclaimed that the confederates were the people of god taking vengeance on the enemies of the lord's spouse and the pope becoming prophet like caiaphas of old gave the confederates the title of defenders of the liberty of the church this sojourn of zuinglius in italy was not without its effect in reference to his vocation of reformer on his return from this campaign he began to study greek in order says he to be able to draw the doctrine of jesus christ from the very fountain of truth writing to vadian twenty third of february fifteen thirteen he says i have resolved so to apply myself to the study of greek that none will be able to turn me from it but god i do it not for fame but from love to sacred literature at a later period a worthy priest who had been his school companion having come to pay him a visit said to him master ulrich i am assured that you are tainted with the new heresy that you are a lutheran i am not a lutheran said zwinglius for i knew greek before i heard of the name of luther to know greek to study the gospel in the original tongue was according to zwinglius the basis of the reformation zwinglius did more than recognize at this early period the great principle of evangelical christianity the infallible authority of the holy scriptures besides this he understood how the meaning of the divine word ought to be ascertained those said he have a very grovelling idea of the scriptures who regard whatever seems to them at variance with their own reason as frivolous vain and unjust men have no right to bind the gospel at pleasure to their own sense and their own interpretation zwinglius raised his eye to heaven said his dearest friend unwilling to have any other interpreter than the holy spirit himself such from the commencement of his career was the man whom some have not scrupled to represent as having wished to subject the bible to human reason philosophy and theology said he ceased not to raise up objections against me i at length arrived at this conclusion we must leave all these things and seek our knowledge of god only in his word i began continues he earnestly to supplicate the lord to give me his light and though i read only the text of scripture it became far clearer to me than if i had read a host of commentators comparing the scriptures with themselves and explaining passages that were obscure by such as were more clear he soon had a thorough knowledge of the bible especially the new testament when zwinglius thus turned toward the holy scriptures switzerland took her first step in the reformation accordingly when he expounded the scriptures every one felt that his lessons came from god and not from man work all divine here exclaims oswald myconius thus was the knowledge of heavenly truth restored to us zwinglius did not however despise the expositions of the most celebrated doctors at a later period he studied origen ambrose jerome augustine chrysostom but not as authorities i study the doctors says he with the same feelings with which one asks a friend what do you understand by this the holy scripture was according to him the touchstone by which the most holy of the doctors were themselves to be tested zwinglius's step was slow but progressive he did not come to the truth like luther amid those tempests which compel the soul to seek a speedy shelter he arrived at it by the peaceful influence of scripture whose power gradually gains upon the heart luther reached the wished-for shore across the billows of the boundless deep 
zwinglius by allowing himself to glide along the stream these are the two principal ways by which god leads men zwinglius was not fully converted to god and his gospel till the first period of his sojourn at zurich yet in fifteen fourteen or fifteen fifteen at the moment when the strong man began to bend the knee to god praying for the understanding of his word the rays of that pure light by which he was afterwards illumined first began to gleam upon him at this period a poem of erasmus in which jesus christ was introduced addressing man as perishing by his own fault made a powerful impression on zwinglius when alone in his study he repeated the passage in which jesus complains that all grace is not sought from him though he is the source of all that is good all said zwinglius all and this word was incessantly present to his mind are there then creatures saints from whom we ought to ask assistance no christ is our only treasure zwinglius did not confine his reading to christian writings one of the distinguishing characteristics of the sixteenth century is the profound study of the greek and roman authors the poetry of hesiod homer pindar enraptured him and he has left us commentaries or characteristics on the last two poets it seemed to him that pindar spoke of his gods in such sublime strains that he must have had some presentiment of the true god he studied cicero and demosthenes thoroughly and learned from them both the art of the orator and the duties of the citizen he called seneca a holy man the swiss mountaineer loved also to initiate himself in the mysteries of nature through the writings of pliny thucydides sallust livy caesar suetonius plutarch and tacitus taught him to know the world he has been censured for his enthusiastic admiration of the great men of antiquity and it is true that some of his observations on this subject cannot be defended but if he honoured them so much it was because he thought he saw in them not human virtues but the influence of the holy spirit the agency of god far from confining itself to ancient times within the limits of palestine extended according to him to the whole world plato said he has also drunk at the divine source and if the two catos if camillus if scipio had not been truly religious would they have been so magnanimous zwinglius diffused around him a love of letters several choice youths were trained in his school you offered me not only books but also yourself wrote valentine Schudi, son of one of the heroes of the wars of burgundy and this young man who at that time had already studied at vienna and Baal under the most celebrated teachers adds i have never met with any one who explained the classics with so much precision and profundity as yourself Chudi repaired to paris and was able to compare the spirit which prevailed in that university with that which we had found in the narrow alpine valley over which impend the gigantic peaks and eternal snows of the dodi the glanish the vigis and the vreiberg how frivolously says he the french youth are educated no poison is so bad as the sophistical art in which they are trained an art which stupefies the senses destroys the judgment brutifies the whole man man is thenceforth like the echo an empty sound ten women could not keep pace with one of these rhetoricians in their prayers even they present their sophisms to god i know the fact and pretend by their syllogisms to constrain the holy spirit to hear them such then were paris and glaris the intellectual metropolis of christendom and a village of alpine shepherds a ray of the divine word gives more light than all human wisdom End of chapter three book eight chapter four of history of the reformation in the sixteenth century volume two by jean henri mail d'aubigne translated by henry beveridge this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter four 
a great man of this age erasmus had much influence on zwinglius who as soon as any of his writings appeared lost no time in procuring it in fifteen hundred and fourteen erasmus had arrived at Basle and been received by the bishop with marks of high esteem all the friends of letters had immediately grouped around him but the monarch of the schools had no difficulty in singling out him who was to be the glory of switzerland i congratulate the swiss nation wrote he to zwinglius that by your studies and your manners both alike excellent you labour to polish and elevate them zwinglius had a most ardent desire to see him spaniards and gauls went to rome to see titus livy said he he set out and on arriving at Basle, found a personage of about forty years of age of small stature a frail body a delicate look but a remarkably amiable and winning address it was erasmus his affability removed the timidity of zwinglius while the power of his intellect overawed him poor said ulrich to him as eschines when each of the scholars of socrates offered a present to his master i give you what eschines gave i give you myself among the literary men who formed the court of erasmus the amabachs the renans the frobeniuses the nessens the glarians zwinglius observed a youth from lucerne of twenty-seven years of age named oswald geishusler erasmus hellenizing his name had called him myconius we will often designate him by his surname to distinguish the friend of zwinglius from frederick myconius the disciple of luther oswald after studying first at rotwell with berthold haller a young man of his own age next at bern and lastly at Basle, had in this last town been appointed rector of the school of st theodoret and afterwards of that of st peter the humble schoolmaster had a very limited income but notwithstanding had married a young girl of a simplicity and purity of soul which won all hearts we have already seen that switzerland was then in a troubled state foreign wars having stirred up violent disorders and the soldiers having brought back to their country licentiousness and brutality one dark and cloudy winter day some of these rude men in oswald's absence attacked his quiet dwelling they knocked at the door threw stones and applied the grossest expressions to his modest spouse at last they burst open the windows and having forced their way into the school and broken everything to pieces made off oswald arrived shortly after his little boy felix ran out to meet him crying while his wife unable to speak showed signs of the greatest terror he understood what had happened and at that moment hearing a noise in the street unable to restrain himself he seized a musket and pursued the villains as far as the burying ground they retreated intending to defend themselves three of them rushed upon myconius and wounded him and while his wound was being dressed these wretches again attacked his house uttering cries of fury oswald says no more of the matter such scenes frequently occurred in switzerland at the beginning of the sixteenth century before the reformation had softened and disciplined manners the integrity of oswald myconius his thirst for science and virtue brought him into connection with zwinglius the rector of the school of Basle was alive to all that was grand in the curate of glaris full of humility he shunned the praises bestowed upon him by zwinglius and erasmus you schoolmasters often said the latter i esteem as highly as i do kings but the modest myconius did not think so i only crawl along the ground said he from infancy i had always a feeling of littleness and humility a preacher who had arrived at Basle about the same time as zwinglius was attracting attention of a mild and pacific disposition he led a tranquil life slow and circumspect in his conduct his chief pleasure was to labour in his study and produce concord among christians he was named john hausschein in greek echolampadius 
that is, light of the house, and was born of wealthy parents in Franconia a year before Zwinglius. His pious mother longed to consecrate to literature and to God the only child whom he had left her. The father intended him first for a mercantile life, then for law but as Ecolampadius was returning from Bologna, where he had been studying law, the Lord, who designed to make him a lamp in the church, called him to the study of theology. He was preaching in his native town when Capito, who had known him at Heidelberg, procured his appointment as preacher at Baal. There he proclaimed Christ with an eloquence which filled his hearers with admiration. Erasmus admitted him to his intimacy, Ecolampadius was enraptured with the hours which he spent in the society of this great genius. In the Holy Scriptures, said the Prince of Literature, one thing only ought to be sought, that is, Jesus Christ. As a memento of his friendship, he gave the young preacher the commencement of John's Gospel. Ecolampadius often kissed this precious pledge of affection and kept it suspended to his crucifix, in order, said he, that I may always remember Erasmus in my prayers. Zwinglius returned to his mountains, his mind and heart full of all that he had seen and heard at Baal. I could not sleep, wrote he to Erasmus, shortly after his return, if I had not conversed for some time with you. There is nothing of which I boast so much as of having seen Erasmus. Zwinglius had received a new impulse. Such journeys often exercise a great influence over the career of the Christian. The disciples of Zwinglius, Valentin, Jost, Louis, Peter, and Aegidius Chudi, his friends the landerman Ebli, the curate Binsley of Wesen, Friedolin Brunnen, and the celebrated Professor Glarion, saw with admiration how he grew in wisdom and knowledge. The old honoured him as a courageous servant of his country, and faithful pastors honoured him as a faithful servant of the Lord. Nothing was done in the district without taking his advice. All the good hoped that he would one day restore the ancient virtue of the Swiss. Francis I, having mounted the throne and being desirous to vindicate the honour of the French name in Italy, the Pope, in alarm, laboured to gain the cantons. Accordingly, in 1515, Ulrich revisited the plains of Italy amid the phalanxes of his fellow citizens. But the division which French intrigues produced in the army stung him to the heart. He was often seen in the middle of the camp energetically and, at the same time wisely, haranguing his hearers in full armour ready for battle. On the 8th of September, five days before the Battle of Marignan, he preached in the public square of Monza, where the Swiss soldiers, who remained true to their colours, had reassembled. Had the counsels of Zwinglius been followed then and afterwards, says Werner Steiner of Zug, what evils would not our country have been saved? But all ears were shut to words of concord, prudence, and submission. The vehement eloquence of Cardinal Schinner electrified the Confederates and hurried them impetuously to the fatal field of Marignan. There fell the flower of the Helvetic youth. Zwinglius, who had been unable to prevent all these disasters, threw himself for the cause of Rome into the midst of danger. His hand seized the sword. Sad error of Zwinglius. A minister of Christ, he more than once forgot that it was his duty to fight only with spiritual weapons, and he was to see in his own person a striking fulfilment of our Saviour's prophecy, He who takes the sword shall perish by the sword. Zwinglius and his Swiss had been unable to save Rome. The ambassador of Venice was the first in the pontifical city who received news of the defeat of Marignan. Delighted, he repaired at an early hour to the Vatican. The Pope came out of his apartment half-dressed to give him an audience. Leo X, on learning the news, did not disguise his terror. At this moment of alarm he saw only Francis I, and hoped only in him. Ambassador, said he, trembling to Zorsi, 
we must throw ourselves into the arms of the king and cry for mercy luther and zwinglius in their danger knew another arm and invoked another mercy this second sojourn in italy was not without use to zwinglius he observed the differences between the ambrosian ritual used at milan and that of rome he collected and compared together the most ancient canons of the mass in this way a spirit of enquiry was developed in him even amid the tumult of camps at the same time the sight of his countrymen led away beyond the alps and given up like cattle to the slaughter filled him with indignation the flesh of the confederates it was said is cheaper than that of their oxen and their calves the disloyalty and ambition of the pope the avarice and ignorance of the priests the licentiousness and dissipation of the monks the pride and luxury of prelates the corruption and venality employed on all hands to win the swiss being forced on his view more strongly than ever made him still more alive to the necessity of a reform in the church from this time zwinglius preached the word of god more clearly in explaining the portions of the gospel and epistles selected for public worship he always compared scripture with scripture he spoke with animation and force and followed with his hearers the same course which god was following with him he did not like luther proclaim the sores of the church but as often as the study of the bible suggested some useful instruction to himself he communicated it to his hearers he tried to make them receive the truth into their hearts and then trusted to it for the works which it behoved to produce if they understand what is true thought he they will discern what is false this maxim is good at the commencement of a reformation but a time comes when error must be boldly stigmatized this zwinglius knew very well the spring said he is the season to sow and with him it was now spring zwinglius has marked out this period fifteen hundred and sixteen as the commencement of the swiss reformation in fact if four years before he had bent his head over the word of god he now raised it and turned it toward his people to make them share in the light which he had found this forms a new and important epoch in the history of the development of the religious revolution of those countries but it has been erroneously concluded from these dates that the reformation of zwinglius preceded that of luther it may be that zwinglius preached the gospel a year before luther's theses but luther himself preached it four years before these famous propositions had luther and zwinglius confined themselves merely to sermons the reformation would not have so quickly gained ground in the church neither luther nor zwinglius was the first monk or the first priest who preached a purer doctrine than that of the schoolmen but luther was the first who publicly and with indomitable courage raised the standard of truth against the empire of error called general attention to the fundamental doctrine of the gospel salvation by grace introduced his age to that new career of knowledge faith and life out of which a new world has arisen in a word began a true and salutary revolution the great struggle of which the theses of 1517 were the signal was truly the birth throe of the reformation giving it at once both a body and a soul luther was the first reformer a spirit of inquiry began to breathe on the mountains of switzerland one day the curate of glaris happening to be in the smiling district of mollis with adam its curate bunsley curate of Vaison, and varicon curate of kerensen these friends discovered an old liturgy in which they read these words after baptizing the child we give him the sacrament of the eucharist and the cup of blood then said zwinglius the supper was at that period dispensed in our churches under the two kinds the liturgy was about two hundred years old this was a great discovery for these priests of the alps the defeat of marignan had important results in the interior of the cantons 
the conqueror francis i lavished gold and flattery in order to gain the confederates while the emperor besought them by their honour by the tears of widows and orphans and the blood of their brethren not to sell themselves to their murderers the french party gained the ascendancy at glaris which from that time was an uncomfortable residence to ulrich zwinglius at glaris might perhaps have remained a man of the world party intrigues political questions the empire france or the duke of milan might have absorbed his whole life those whom god means to prepare for great services he never leaves amid the turmoil of the world he leads them apart and places them in a retreat where they commune with him and their own consciences and receive lessons never to be effaced the son of god himself who in this was a type of the training given to his servants spent forty days in the desert it was time to remove zwinglius from political movements which continually pressing upon his thoughts might have banished the spirit of god from them it was time to train him for another stage than that on which courtiers cabinets and parties move and where he should have wasted powers worthy of nobler employment his country indeed needed something else it was necessary that a new life should now come down from heaven and that he who was to be the instrument in communicating it should unlearn worldly things in order to learn things above the two spheres are entirely distinct a wide space separates these two worlds and before passing entirely from the one to the other zwinglius was to sojourn for a time on neutral ground in a kind of intermediate and preparatory state to be there taught of god god accordingly took him away from the factions of glaris and with a view to this novitiate placed him in the solitude of a hermitage confining within the narrow walls of an abbey this noble germ of the reformation which was shortly after to be transplanted to a better soil and cover the mountains with its shadow end of chapter four book eight chapter five of history of the reformation in the sixteenth century volume two by jean henri mail d'aubigne translated by henry beveridge this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter five meinrad of hohenzollern a german monk about the middle of the ninth century wandering on till he came between the lakes of zurich and walstetten had stopped upon a hill resting on an amphitheatre of firs and there built a cell banditti imbrued their hands in the blood of the saint the bloody cell was long deserted but towards the end of the tenth century a convent and a church in honour of the virgin were erected on the sacred spot on the eve of the day of consecration when the bishop of constance and his priests were at prayers in the church a celestial chant proceeding from invisible voices suddenly echoed through the chapel they prostrated themselves and listened in amazement the next day when the bishop was going to consecrate the chapel a voice repeated thrice stop brother stop god himself has consecrated it it was said that christ in person had blessed it during the night that the chant which they had heard proceeded from angels apostles and saints and that the virgin standing upon the altar had blazed forth like a flash of lightning a bull of pope leo the seventh forbade the faithful to question the truth of this legend thenceforward an immense crowd of pilgrims ceased not to repair to our lady of the eremites to the consecration of angels delphi and ephesus in ancient and loretto in modern times alone have equalled the fame of einsiedlen it was in this strange place that in fifteen sixteen ulrich zwinglius was called as priest and preacher zwinglius hesitated not neither ambition nor avarice takes me there said he but the intrigues of the french higher motives determined him on the one hand having more solitude more calmness and a less extensive parish he could devote more time to study and meditation 
on the other hand this place of pilgrimage would give him facilities for spreading the knowledge of jesus christ to the remotest countries the friends of evangelical preaching at glaris expressed deep grief what worse could happen to glaris said peter Schudi, one of the most distinguished citizens of the canton than to be deprived of so great a man his parishioners finding him immovable resolved to leave him the title of pastor of glaris with part of the benefice and the means of returning when he chose conrad of rechberg a gentleman of ancient family grave candid intrepid and occasionally somewhat rude was one of the most celebrated sportsmen of the district to which zwinglius was removed he had established on one of his farms a manege in which he reared a breed of horses which became celebrated in italy such was the abbot of our lady of the eremites rechberg was equally averse to the pretensions of rome and the discussions of theologians one day during a visitation of the order some observations were made to him i am master here not you said he somewhat rudely get along one day at a table when leo judah was discussing some difficult point with the administrator of the convent the hunting abbot exclaimed you there leave your disputes to me i exclaim with david have pity on me o god according to thy goodness and enter not into judgment with thy servant i have no need to know any more baron theobald of geroldsek was administrator of the monastery he was of a meek spirit sincerely pious and had a great love of literature his favorite design was to form a society of well-informed men in his convent and it was for this reason he had given a call to zwinglius eager for instruction and reading he begged his new friend to direct him read the holy scriptures replied zwinglius and that you may better understand them study jerome however added he the time will come and by god's help it is not far off when christians will not set a high value either on jerome or any other doctor but only on the word of god the conduct of geroldsek gave an indication of his progress in the faith he allowed the nuns of a convent dependent on einsiedlin to read the bible in the vulgar tongue and some years after geroldsek came to live at zurich beside zwinglius and to die with him on the field of Capel. the charm which hung about zwinglius soon united him in tender friendship not only with geroldsek but also the chaplain zinc the excellent exlin and other inmates of the abbey these studious men far from the noise of party joined together in reading the scriptures the fathers of the church the masterpieces of antiquity and the writings of the restorers of letters this interesting society was often enlarged by friends from a distance among others capito one day arrived at einsiedlin the two old friends of baal walked together over the convent and the wild scenery in its neighbourhood absorbed in conversation examining the scriptures and seeking to know the divine will there was a point on which they were agreed and it was this the pope of rome must fall at this time capito was more courageous than he was at a later period repose leisure books friends all these zwinglius had in this tranquil retreat and he accordingly grew in understanding and in faith at this period may fifteen hundred and seventeen he commenced a work which was of great utility to him as in old time the kings of israel wrote the law of god with their own hand so zwinglius with his copied the epistles of st paul the only editions of the new testament then in existence were of large size and zwinglius wished to have one which he could carry about with him these epistles he learned by heart as he did afterwards the other books of the new and a part of the old testament thus his heart became always more attached to the sovereign authority of the word of god 
he was not satisfied with merely acknowledging this he was moreover desirous to bring his life into true subjection to it his views gradually became more decidedly christian the end for which he had been brought into this desert was accomplished it is no doubt true that zurich is the place where his whole soul became thoroughly pervaded with christian principle but even now at einsiedlen he made decided progress in the work of sanctification at glaris he had taken part in the amusements of the world at einsiedlen he was more anxious for a life unsullied by any taint of worldliness beginning to have a better idea of the great spiritual interests of the people he gradually learned what god designed to teach him providence had also other views in bringing him to einsiedlen here he obtained a nearer view of the superstitions and abuses which had invaded the church an image of the virgin which was carefully preserved in this monastery had it was said the power of working miracles above the gate of the abbey appeared this presumptuous inscription here is obtained a plenary remission of all sins a multitude of pilgrims flocked to einsiedlen from all parts of christendom to merit this grace by their pilgrimage the church the abbey and the whole valley were crowded with devout worshippers on the festivals of the virgin but it was especially at the grand festival of the consecration of the angels that the hermitage was crowded to overflowing thousands of individuals of both sexes climbed the acclivity of the hill leading to the oratory singing hymns and counting their beads these devout pilgrims crowded into the church thinking they were there nearer god than anywhere else the residence of zwinglius at einsiedlen was in regard to the exposure of papal abuses similar in effect to luther's visit to rome zwinglius's education for reformer was completed at einsiedlen god alone is the source of salvation and he is so everywhere these were the two truths which he learned at einsiedlen and they became fundamental articles in his creed the serious impression produced on his soul soon manifested itself externally struck with the many prevailing evils he resolved to oppose them boldly not hesitating between his conscience and his interest he stood up openly and in plain and energetic terms attacked the superstition of the surrounding crowds think not said he from the pulpit that god is in this temple more than in any other part of his creation whatever be the country in which you dwell god encompasses you and hears you as well as in our lady of einsiedlen can useless works long pilgrimages offerings images the invocation of the virgin or the saints obtain the grace of god what avails the multitude of words in which we embody our prayers what avails a glossy hood a head well shaven a long robe with its neat folds and mules caparisoned with gold god looks to the heart but our heart is alienated from god but zwinglius wished to do more than lift his voice against superstition he wished to satisfy that eager longing for reconciliation with god felt by many of the pilgrims who had flocked to the chapel of our lady of einsiedlen christ cried he like a john baptist in this new wilderness of judea christ who was once offered on the cross is the expiatory victim who even through eternity makes satisfaction for the sins of all believers thus zwinglius advanced the day when this bold sermon was heard in the most venerated sanctuary of switzerland the standard prepared against rome began to be more distinctly displayed on its mountain heights and there was so to speak a heaving of reform reaching even to their deepest foundations in fact universal astonishment seized the multitude on hearing the discourse of the eloquent priest some walked off in horror others hesitated between the faith of their fathers and the doctrine fitted to secure their peace 
while several came to jesus christ who was thus preached to them and finding rest to their souls took back the tapers which they had intended to present to the virgin a crowd of pilgrims returned to their homes announcing everywhere what they had heard at einsiedlen christ alone saves and saves everywhere bands astonished at what they heard stopped short without finishing their pilgrimage the worshippers of mary diminished from day to day their offerings formed almost the whole income of zwinglius and geroldseck but the intrepid witness of the truth felt happy to be impoverished in order that souls might be spiritually enriched during the feast of pentecost in the year fifteen hundred and eighteen among the numerous hearers of zwinglius was a learned man of meek temper and active charity named gaspard hedio doctor of theology at baal zwinglius preached on the cure of the paralytic luke chapter five where our saviour declares the son of man hath power upon earth to forgive sins words well fitted to strike the crowd assembled in the church of the virgin the preacher roused enraptured and inflamed his audience especially the doctor from baal a long time after hedio expressed his high admiration how beautiful said he this discourse how profound weighty complete penetrating and evangelical how much it reminds one of the energy of the ancient doctors from that moment hedio admired and loved zwinglius he would fain have gone to him and opened his heart he wandered around the abbey but durst not approach kept back as he expresses it by a superstitious timidity he again mounted his horse and slowly retired from our lady ever and again turning his head to the spot which contains so great a treasure and feeling in his heart the keenest regret thus zwinglius preached less forcibly no doubt than luther but with more moderation and not less success he did nothing precipitately and did not come so violently into collision with men's minds as the saxon reformer he expected everything from the power of truth he displayed the same wisdom in his relations with the heads of the church far from immediately declaring himself their enemy he long remained their friend they were exceedingly indulgent to him not only because of his learning and talents luther had the same claims to the regard of the bishops of mentz and brandenburg but especially because of his attachment to the pope's political party and the influence possessed by such a man as zwinglius in a republican state in fact several cantons disgusted with the service of the pope were disposed to break with him but the legates flattered themselves they might retain several of them by gaining zwinglius as they gained erasmus with pensions and honours at this time the legates ennius and pucci went frequently to einsiedlen where from its proximity to the democratic cantons it was more easy to carry on negotiations with them but zwinglius far from sacrificing the truth to the demands and offers of rome omitted no opportunity of defending the gospel the famous schinner who had then some disturbance in his diocese passed some time at einsiedlin the whole papacy said zwinglius one day rests on a bad foundation put your hand to the work remove errors and abuses or you will see the whole edifice crumble to pieces with fearful uproar he spoke with the same frankness to legate pucci four times did he return to the charge with the help of god said he to him i will continue to preach the gospel and this preaching will shake rome then he pointed out to him what was necessary to save the church pucci promised everything but did nothing zwinglius declared that he renounced the pension from the pope the legate entreated him to retain it and zwinglius who at that time had no thought of placing himself in open hostility to the head of the church consented for three years to receive it but think not added he that for the love of money i retrench a single syllable of the truth 
Pucci, alarmed, made the reformer be appointed chaplain acolyte to the Pope. It was an avenue to new honours. Rome thought to frighten Luther by sentences of condemnation, and to win Zwinglius by favours, darting her excommunications at the one, and displaying her gold and magnificence to the other. She thus endeavoured, by two different methods, to attain the same end, and silence the bold lips which dared, in spite of the Pope, to proclaim the word of God in Germany and Switzerland. The latter method was the more skilful, but neither of them succeeded. The enfranchised souls of the preachers of truth were equally inaccessible to menace and favour. Another Swiss prelate, Hugo of Landenberg, Bishop of Constance, at this time gave some hope to Zwinglius. He ordered a general visitation of the churches. But Landenberg, a man of no character, allowed himself to be led alternately by Faber, his vicar, and by an abandoned female, from whose sway he was unable to escape. He occasionally appeared to honour the gospel, and yet any one who preached it boldly was in his eyes only a disturber. He was one of those men too common in the church, who, though loving truth better than error, have more indulgence for error than for truth, and often end by turning against those with whom they ought to make common cause. Zwinglius applied to him, but in vain. He was to have the same experience which Luther had, to be convinced that it was useless to invoke the heads of the church, and that the only method of restoring Christianity was to act as a faithful teacher of the word of God. An opportunity of doing so soon occurred. In August 1518, a Franciscan monk was seen travelling on the heights of St. Gotthard, in those lofty passes which have been laboriously cut across the steep rocks separating Switzerland from Italy. Having come forth from an Italian convent, he was the bearer of papal indulgences which he was commissioned to sell to the good Christians of the Helvetic League. Brilliant success, obtained under two preceding popes, had signalized his exertions in this shameful traffic. Companions, intended to puff off the merchandise which he was going to sell, were accompanying him across mountains of snow and ice coeval with the world. This avaricious band, in appearance miserable enough, and not unlike a band of adventurers roaming for plunder, walked in silence amid the noise of the foaming torrents which give rise to the Rhine, the Reuss, the Ahr, the Rhone, the Ticino, and other rivers, meditating how they were to plunder the simple population of Helvetia. Samson, this was the Franciscan's name, and his company, first arrived in Uri, and there commenced their traffic. They had soon done with these poor peasants, and passed into the canton of Schwitz. Here Zwinglius was, and here the combat between these two servants of two very different masters was to take place. "'I can pardon all sins,' said the Italian monk, the Tetzel of Switzerland. "'Heaven and hell are subject to my power.' and I sell the merits of Jesus Christ to whoever will purchase them by paying in cash for an indulgence. Zwinglius heard of these discourses, and his zeal was inflamed. He preached powerfully against them. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, said he, thus speaks, Come unto me, all ye that labour and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Is it not, then, audacious folly and insensate temerity to say, on the contrary, purchase letters of indulgence, run to Rome, give to the monks, sacrifice to the priests? If you do these things, I will absolve you from your sins. Jesus Christ is the only offering. Jesus Christ is the only sacrifice. Jesus Christ is the only way. Everybody at Schwitz began to call Samson rogue and cheat. He took the road to Zug, and for this time the two champions failed to meet. Scarcely had Samson left Schwitz when a citizen of this canton named Stapfer, a man of distinguished talent and afterwards Secretary of State, 
was with his family reduced to great distress alas said he when applying in agony to zwinglius i know not how to satisfy my own hunger and the hunger of my poor children zwinglius knew to give where rome knew to take he was as ready to practise good works as to combat those who taught that they were the means of obtaining salvation he daily gave liberally to stapfer it is god said he anxious not to take any glory to himself it is god who begets charity in the believer and gives him at once the thought the resolution and the work itself whatever good a righteous man does it is god who does it by his own power stapfer remained attached to him through life and four years after when he had become secretary of state and felt once of a higher kind he turned towards zwinglius and said to him with noble candour since you provided for my temporal wants how much more may i now expect from you wherewith to appease the hunger of my soul the friends of zwinglius increased not only at glaris baal and schwitz did he find men of like spirit with himself in uri there was the secretary of state schmidt at zug colin muller and werner steiner his old companions in arms at marignan at lucerne xylotect and kirchmeyer wittenbach at bern and many others in many other places but the curate of einsiedlen had no more devoted friend than oswald myconius oswald had quitted baal in fifteen sixteen to take charge of the cathedral school at zurich in this town there were no learned men and no schools of learning oswald laboured along with some well-disposed individuals among others eutinger notary to the pope to raise the zurich population out of ignorance and initiate them in ancient literature at the same time he defended the immutable truth of the holy scriptures and declared that if the pope or emperor gave commands contrary to the gospel obedience was due to god alone who is above both emperor and pope end of book 8 chapter 5